this is what I like about my gig. It's a lot more, um, it's like, yeah, like, like with last night, I knew where I was going because I had a specific yeah, yeah, direction and I had a time and right. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I want to have, um, I just want to have conversations. Can't believe with I messed up with my own Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> it's all going to look the same when it, when it comes out on the, on the, the, uh, closed caption. <laughs> Before we start today's show, please visit the sponsors, affiliates, and friends of the Stagecoach. The Square Reviews, brutally honest product and travel reviews for red-blooded Americans by red-blooded Americans. Visit them at thesquarereviews.com. Thegunfood.com has an extensive network of partners to connect you with your guns, ammunition, and firearm training. The Gun Food only sells ammo that they trust. Use RSWC as a discount code and save 5.56% on your order at thegunfood.com. PowerTac flashlights have combined premium craftsmanship, American ingenuity, and cutting-edge technology, creating a highly dependable tool that you can trust your life with. Go to powertac.com RSWC and save 15% on your order. That's powertac.com RSWC. Saber Pepper Spray has been making grown men cry since 1975. Find the link in the show description and help get the stagecoach across America with every Saber Red purchase you make. Riding shotgun refers to the practice of sitting next to the driver in a moving vehicle. The term riding shotgun came around after the time of the stagecoach when somebody used to sit next to the driver holding a shotgun in case they ran into bandits. My name is Charlie Cook, and I drive a lot. I like to talk to people while I'm driving, so I interview people in my car while I'm driving. Welcome to Riding Shotgun with Charlie. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of Writing Shotgun with Charlie. If you are new here and new to the channel, please hit the like and subscribe because that's good for all stuff YouTube. If you're listening to the podcast, please share the podcast with people. That is always greatly appreciated because that is how we get the stagecoach across America. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of Writing Shotgun with Charlie. Today we are coming to you from Voorhees, New Jersey, and I have with me Rabbi Andy Mars. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. A pleasure to be here. I'm glad I got your name right this time. <laughs> <laughs> so we were at uh, we were at an event last night for the Coalition of New Jersey Firearm Owners and the Women for Gun Rights, and I was the MC. You were a speaker, and somebody took your intro. <laughs> that's what that's what I'm going with. Someone took your intro because I couldn't Espionage. find it. Espionage. Mean, yes, I know. Somebody's up to something. Um, I have no idea what happened to it, and I screwed. And I, I didn't have your intro, and I screwed your name up. So the, I'm the like, message is uh, important. The man is not. Well, the man's important too. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about you. How did you get into? Uh, how did you get into gun stuff? And how did you become um, a rabbi that's a pro gun, pro gun rabbi? Well, as far as being a pro gun rabbi, I believe every rabbi should be a pro gun mm. rabbi. The Torah is very clear. You heard more last night. All sorts of excerpts from Torah here and there and everywhere. Yeah, that we have the right. And as I said, the responsibility to be able to protect ourselves. You know, we can go back to the time of Cain and Abel, as I mentioned last night, and had God banned rocks at that time. What would David have had against Goliath? Right? Exactly. Exactly. And we go through our Jewish history. You know, many of our ancestors and our heroes had weapons of whatever were the weapons of the time from, mm -hmm. you know, spears to arrows to this to that. And we have to be able to defend ourselves. Um, you know, one of the people who I greatly admire, and there are plenty in this world, is uh, former cabinet member, presidential candidate, brain surgeon, Ben Carson. And Ben Carson had put it very clearly in one of his books and many of his talks. He was relatively crucified for it. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, he made it very clear. The Holocaust would not have happened, not necessarily not have happened, but would not have happened have at least bad. as it did right. if we had not allowed, so to speak, the German authorities to take away our guns in the years preceding the Holocaust. And 
the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, called him and what he said ludicrous, but he responded and said that they were being foolish, and I agree with him. It is foolish to not arm ourselves, to not allow ourselves to protect ourselves, and that's just a simple reality, and like I said, throughout the Torah, there are incidents and incidents and incidents, and hello, let's look at the world today and what's going on in Israel and all mm. of that, that we need to be able to defend ourselves, Absolutely. and I won't get too heavily into the politics of what was going on in Israel leading up to October 7th, but, you know, for years and years in Israel, people had their guns and they right. could better protect themselves. And we have the right, we have the responsibility to be able to protect ourselves. It is a Jewish value. As far as I'm concerned, it is a violation of Jewish law not to be allowed to be armed to be able to protect ourselves. So it's not like one thing that led me to where I am. Mm -hmm. It's just the natural process of knowing my history, of knowing my Torah, and of knowing reality and deciding, therefore, that we this should be able made. to be armed to protect ourselves. Very cool. Um, I don't know if you know who Yehuda Reamer is. Yehuda Reamer, we talked about him. Right. And Yehuda I know Reamer the name, is, but I don't know him. Yeah. He's the Pew Pew Jew. And he cha he updated the for every uh, for every Jew at twenty two. He updated it to for every Jew a seven six two. Oh God, <laughs> which is pretty funny. Um, have you always been a? Uh, what, what's your experience with with firearms and shooting? Did you grow up shooting? I, I, I I'm going to assume probably not, right? I did not. No, okay. I did not grow up shooting. Um, you know, throughout the years, I've had opportunities and experiences to be able to get involved with, um, and. You know, go to the range here and there. Um, mm -hmm. When I lived in Los Angeles, I went to the range with uh, the police department range with some of the officers that I worked with out there. That's um, pretty cool. I've, uh, over the years, I've actually trained officers on working uh, on, on how to deal with kids in crisis when they are showing up to a situation and, you know, mm -hmm. trying to calm and mitigate, you know, a child's, uh, you know, emotional turmoil and whatnot when they're either they're a witness or a parent's involved in something or whatever. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I, I've shot at different ranges, uh, you know, here in New Jersey. I'm obviously here in New Jersey at this point. And and California and New Jersey are two wonderful states to be in. Um, I, I, I moved up a little bit. Right. It's You have to ask yourself, do you want a punch in the face or a kick in the stomach? Well, there you like go. They're, they're both bad. They're yes. both not good choices. Yes, they're, they're a little extreme. Um, but, uh, you, know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a pistol guy. And, you know. What do you like to shoot? Well, Colt 1911 is a particular preference. I, uh, I always, the first time I held the 1911, I always thought it was a man's gun. And when I held it, I'm like, this is what it's like yeah. to be a man. And then I realized my man thumb did not hit the slide release. Uh, I'm like, yeah. ah, okay. <laughs> and then I also recently got a, uh, you know, more concealed uh, Smith & Wesson, uh, you know, Shield Plus. Shield, nice. Yeah. Very cool. But, uh, you know, I prefer shooting a 45. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. But again, to me, it's not even a matter of if and how much and what I'm shooting or whatever. It's just the fact that every Jew and every American citizen should have the right to be able to defend themselves. Mm, period. Abs absolutely, absolutely. The rights, the rights been there. Um, the rights been there. The Second Amendment makes right. sure that it's there. But people read things in different ways and try to this is true. misinterpret well, and misrepresent. Right. Like, what is a militia? Yes. Right. One of the things you talked about last night was the difference between uh, between killing and murder. Yes. Which was which was interesting. Let's talk about that. Yeah. I mean, you know, again, as I shared, you know, Torah makes it very clear um, that basically in uh, Hargacha Larshko my Hebrew is off right now. I'm, I'm just messing myself it's, up. But it's anyway, early in the morning. You should um, have yes, one that's coffee. what it is. I didn't even have a cup of coffee this morning. Um, do you have some cranberry juice, though? Oh, nice. Anyway, um, if someone comes to kill you, kill them first. Right. It's clear. It's in Sanhedrin 72A. And it is very clear that we should be able to. And yes, you're right. We do have the right. We've always had the right. But there are those that see things and say things and interpret things and misinterpret things and misrepresent things differently. Yeah. But we should be able to defend ourselves. You know, we're not expected to go out and murder somebody, but we have the right to kill somebody if they are coming to kill us. And we have the right not just to protect ourselves, but we have the right to protect our families, our friends, our communities, mm. our neighbors. Yeah. We have that right and we have that responsibility. Yeah, we absolutely do. So one of the things the, um, the, the Germans did is they went through... And uh, they registered all the firearms, right? Yeah. This is, I mean, this... this. Well, what's going on yeah, right now? It, it is. And I'm, uh, I don't know if you know who Evan Knappen is. 
Uh, Evan Knappen, he's an attorney here in New Jersey. Uh, he's got a, a show called the, uh, the Gun Lawyer Podcast. It comes out on Sundays. Evan was a guest on the show. Um, uh, a couple years ago, but Evan Knappen says that registration leads, uh, sorry, legislation leads to registration, which leads Regis- to registration leads to confiscation, which then and confiscation leads to extermination. Exactly. And by the way, I'm going to correct my Hebrew. Imba- I wouldn't have known. Yeah. hashkim <laughs> If someone comes to kill you, kill them first. It only makes sense. Even uh, uh, who's the guy? Who's the old guy? There's a lot of old guys. I know. <laughs> I got to be a little more specific. Some of us are getting a little older. <laughs> um, uh, the Tibetan Mall. The Dalai Lama. Oh. Even the Dalai Lama. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that old guy. That um, guy. Right. The, even the Dalai Lama. There's a quote from the Dalai Lama that says... Did he say it? I don't know. If, <laughs> all right. So I saw it on the internet, so it's got to be true. <laughs> Everything on the internet is true, except for that which is not. Yes. Uh, it's not. Okay. No, I don't. <laughs> right, but no. What was the quote? The, the quote is very much along the same lines. If someone's going to kill you, you should be able to kill him back. Or someone kill him back. Shoot, <laughs> if someone's going to shoot you, you should you should be able to shoot back. You know, and, well, and again, shoot first. You know, Torah actually says, "Get up in the morning earlier and kill him before he has the chance to kill you." Mm. Yeah, we got to be proactive, yeah. not reactive. Oh my gosh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting to talk to people that are non-gun folks that. They they inherently believe that they should be able to protect themselves, but they don't want to do anything to protect themselves. You well, know? a lot of people expect someone else to be the one to do. Right. You know, and it's the same thing. Like, you know, I'm first aid CPR certified. Let's not test that right now, though. Okay, please. <laughs> Especially while you're driving. I'm trying to focus. But, you know, in, you know, I run summer camps and things like that. And, you know, you're in programs, whether it be an educator or in a camp or other programs with kids. You know, and every staff member should be first aid and CPR certified. Hopefully right. you never need to use it. Absolutely. Same thing with a gun. Hopefully you never need to use it, but it is the responsible thing to be able to protect yourself. It's the responsible thing to be able to use first aid and CPR. But I have not been in situations, but I have known people who've been in situations where somebody needs medical attention of that nature Mm -hmm. and everybody's looking to somebody else, even people who are certified. And that's part of our problem with our world today as well. One of the many problems with our world today is that everybody's worried about the liability, right? Well, yes, I could save somebody's life, but somebody might sue me. Maybe I'll, you know, you know, hurt hurt them, hurt a ribbon, something or whatever. And, Everybody's afraid for themselves instead of concerned about the welfare of everyone else and others around them. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with guns. I mean, of course, that's one of the big issues, too. You know, people even who, you know, have their proper permits and licensing and whatnot, they're afraid. They shoot. They're going to get sued. Uh, Yeah, it's. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I, I, I hate to admit this, but I'm completely lacking in the medical stuff. And I, I've heard plenty of people say that if you're going to carry a gun, you should carry some sort of, um, you know, uh, trauma kit, Yeah. you know, and plenty, I know there's plenty of places that, uh, that have trauma kits that you can carry on your ankle. Yeah. They're like, you need to have some bandages, you need to have a tourniquet, yeah. um, and a, and a chest seal. I haven't seen those uh, ankle kits, but I like that idea. I mean, yeah. you know, always having the car and a backpack. I've always got something of that nature with us. It's, uh, yeah, because it's the, uh, I guess the interesting thing, the, th- the thing that made the light go off for me is that when, when, uh, if we're carrying a gun to, because we think we're going to be confronted with something, right? A life or death situation. There's, there's a real good chance that if you think you're carrying a gun, that you're going to run into people that need some sort of medical help. Right. And the people that carry the, uh, the IFACs, the, uh, individual first aid kits, they, um, they say they've often used it for, for car accidents or for, you know, somebody, whatever fell, I don't know. I have well, often been. In, in, I have often been in situations where I see somebody in an accident on the side of the road, and I'm just the person who will stop and see if somebody needs help and what what can I do? Mm-hmm. You know, whether it be as simple as you know their cell phone broke in a, an accident and they need to borrow a cell phone, or whether they yeah. need medical attention. And yeah, you know, it is important. I'm glad to, to use the first aid kit that I have. That's why I have it. That's why you have I'd it. rather never need it, mm-hmm. but I'm glad to have it. And it's the same thing with a gun. I'd rather never need it. Right. Yeah, you know, it's one thing to you know just go out and shoot a target, just keep your accuracy up. Mm-hmm. But it's another thing to you know feel like you actually have to use it in an emergency situation. Yeah, for sure. It's uh, we were talking about this at breakfast. It's interesting that you talk to some people that are non-gun folks, and they're like, "So what are you going to get a gun? Like you're going to carry a gun? What are you going to need a gun for? In case somebody parks too close to you? 
<laughs> you're like, dude, <laughs> I like to tell them, I don't think you're smart enough to have a gun. <laughs> well, because that's not what guns are used for. They're used for if I don't, uh, if I don't shoot this person, I'm going to die. Right. Like that's, yeah. that's really what it comes or, down or to. Or the defense of someone else as well. Yeah. Yeah. You see something bad going down and right. put an end to it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But you know, it's the same thing. As I said, you know, I lived in California for 30 years and I had the experience, which we just recently had here in New Jersey of these things where the earth is shaking. Right. Mm -hmm. And I learned the value of having an earthquake kit in your car. You carry an earthquake kit, mm. you know, in the front hall closet, you're ready to grab an earthquake kit. If you got to get out of a building and there are a multitude of supplies that you should have in your earthquake, er earthquake kit, you know, mm -hmm. emergency preparedness. Yeah. And Having a firearm is just a part of that. It's it really just one is. of many pieces of responsible living. But we live in a world today where people don't live responsibly. We seem to live in a world today of apathy, of laziness, of misguided attitudes, mm -hmm. of misguided information. There's a lot of problems in the world today. And once upon a time, I'd like to believe, and sometime in the future, I'd like to be able to see that we live in a world where people actually have a sense of consciousness and a sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, as a rabbi, I'm an educator. As a rabbi, you know, I'm supposed to be knowing my Torah inside and out. I'm supposed to know, you know, we look at, you know, the Torah is is as we call it the guidebook of life okay it's like your instruction manual on how to live life in fact i'll just analogize for a second because i have a feeling you might know but i don't know we never had this conversation before <laughs> you remember an old tv show the greatest american hero oh my god from the late 70s yes yeah absolutely. i had a feeling you'd know that show and appreciate that show one of the lessons i use with kids often is about that show even though they may not know the show i teach it to them anyway the star of the show, right? He happens to be a special ed high school teacher. And who's he, got a, uh, a <laughs> say again? He's got curly white hair, a curly blonde hair. Blondish, right? very, very blondish, yeah. yes. Um, almost like a blondish reddish, if I remember correctly. He's got the red suit and all that. But, yeah. you know, he, he, he's on a high school field trip out in the desert mm -hmm. with his special ed kids. And the van breaks down. There's an FBI agent out there. His car breaks down. It was all guided by something beyond them, some UFO, and wasn't <laughs> unidentified to them, but nonetheless. You know, this <laughs> flying saucer. It gives him a superhero suit. Mm. And he's walking back to his van. He's got this superhero suit. It's a, it's a surreal experience. And my favorite scene in the whole series is the fact that he's carrying the box, the special box with the superhero suit yeah, and the manual falls out in the desert in the sand oh, and recurring throughout the series, throughout the episodes is he lost the manual. He doesn't know what his superhero suit can do. <laughs> he doesn't know how to do the things his superhero suit enables him to do. Yeah. And I tell kids, that's the way it is with life. Mm. Okay. Every one of us has superpowers. Yeah. We don't know what they are. Part of our struggle of life is to figure out what they are. And then we have to figure out how to use them, mm -hmm. how to cultivate them and master them. And I look at, well, Torah is our manual to life. We didn't lose it in the desert as we're heading into Passover, which is a whole other thing we should talk about. But we didn't lose that. Right. But many people have lost it because they're not reading it. They don't know their Hebrew. They don't know how to study it. They don't know how to analyze it. They don't know how to let it guide them on how to live life. So one of the things we talked about a lot last night was that there are all sorts of lessons in the Torah that do teach us about responsible living, of which being able to protect ourselves and others is a part of that responsible living. And so we need to get back to, as far as I'm concerned, the manual the manual that we were given in the desert and we didn't lose it in the desert. Mm -hmm. Now I said Passover, by the way, I'm going to mention real quickly. Yes. So yesterday, you know, e every Saturday is Shabbat. It is our holy day of rest. It is the right. seventh day of our week. You know, God rested on the seventh day. We rest too. We regenerate ourselves. We refocus ourselves. Uh, you know, you met my son last night. We spend most of Saturday studying Torah for hours and hours every week. Um, and, but yesterday's Shabbat was special. Well, every Shabbat is special. Yesterday's Shabbat was called Shabbat Hagadol. It is the great Shabbat. It is the Shabbat that precedes Passover every year. Because okay. Passover, the Jewish holiday of freedom, Zman it will be starting this Monday. That's tomorrow already, <laughs> when the sun sets. 
when okay. we leave here, I'm going to be going and picking up the last produce supplies to be making a feast for 20, 30 people. <laughs> okay. Nice. Anyway, um, but Passover is the holiday of our freedom. Mm-hmm. And I'll mention more about that in a moment. But Shabbat HaGadol is the Sabbath preceding Passover. And I like to think of it and teach of it this way, that it is historically the anniversary of the last Shabbat when we were enslaved in Egypt because we are freed just right after that. Mm. And so it's incredibly powerful. And here we're talking about guns and rights and freedom. Yeah. And that's really important. So Passover is our holiday of freedom. This Shabbat is a time to leave our enslavement behind. It's time for our exodus. It is time for us to move forward into freedom. But Passover, you may or may not know, I know it's not your background, seven weeks, seven weeks of seven days, 49 days after the first day of Passover takes us to the holiday, an equal holiday to Passover, the holiday of Shavuot. And it is the holiday where we celebrate receiving the Torah, that manual we received in the desert on how to live life. Mm -hmm. And so if we call Passover the holiday of our freedom, then I like to call Shavuot the holiday of our freedom with responsibility. We weren't freed from slavery just to do whatever we want. Mm -hmm. We were freed from slavery with a purpose, with responsibility to be or is the is, is the term to be a light unto the nations to bring more light into this world and so again connecting back to your initial question of course is you know I, my mission as a rabbi is to see how i can bring more light into this world mm. and to be more good to do more good to bring more good into this world and a part of that is helping people especially within the jewish community Learn the rules, the laws, the history, the stories, the values, the morals of Torah. And we need to go back to the source. We need to learn the lessons. But then we can't just learn it. We have to live by it. And that goes to the point that you were making. There are plenty of people who are like, yeah, 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 we should be able to have guns, but I don't want to be bothered. Right. And we have to learn, but then we have to do. The purpose of learning is to then live accordingly, not just to be some pedantic scholar who knows a bunch of stuff, but doesn't live accordingly. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Do you do you get any sort of pushback from your, um, I don't want to say congregation? Yeah, That's you can use word. that word. It's, okay. Yeah, congregants, yeah. From, from, the, from the synagogue? Like, do, do other members of your synagogue that push back on any of this? Well, I'm sure there are those, I know there are those who don't agree with me on certain things. Right. But... I think, you know, they wouldn't still be involved and come if they didn't at least respect the fact that I see things as I do, I make the choices as I do, Mm -hmm. but they may not do that. It's the same thing with everything else, you know, religiously. Like, you know, for instance, you know, yesterday, Shabbat, okay? Um, You know, we don't cook on Shabbat. We eat leftovers on Shabbat. That's our family way. There are Jews who, you know, their little loophole if they have something stewing on a, you know, on a, you know, on, on a cholent stove or whatever. And yeah. They, yeah. Anyway, but the point is, you know, we don't cook on Shabbat. Okay. We don't go shopping on Shabbat. We don't spend money on Shabbat. You know, we don't create on Shabbat. We don't destroy on Shabbat. So it's like, you know, like my son, you know, so I'm playing guitar last night. Mm-hmm. He doesn't play guitar on Shabbat. Okay. Because he'd be creating and potentially even destroying because strings can break, etc. So we live, you know, we live by our Shabbat rules. Okay. Yeah. I know other Jews who live by a different set of Shabbat rules and mm-hmm. I can respect the fact that, you know, different people may interpret some of the things oh. the same way, um, in the same thing in different ways. Sure. Um, you know, the Torah is very clear about certain things mm-hmm. and it can be fuzzy about other things. Yeah. You know, uh, honor and keep the Sabbath day. Well, there are different ways I can respect to be able to do that. Um, the fact that you, if someone comes to kill you, you kill him first. That's a clear statement. That's not a controversial issue from Torah, in my opinion. Yeah. That is n- not even in my opinion, in, in, in my clear reading. It's th- There are things that are clear. There are things that are fuzzy. Um, but, you know, people who come and participate in services and whatnot with me, they are people who may or may not agree, may or may not live the same way, mm-hmm. but they're going to, you know, hear and learn Torah as I'm teaching it and what they do with it is up to them. Now, I will say I get more pushback, not so much from people who you might call congregants, 
but from fellow clergy sometimes who don't want to see what I am saying. Right. Um, and again, it's whether it be with the gun issue or with various other issues, some days people, they see things their way. Mm-hmm. And, then it, it, and it's not just within clergy. It's the world we live in right now. We were talking about earlier over breakfast. I don't remember if you were at the table at that time. Um, but we were talking about how one of the things that I have said more times than I can count, and many kids have heard me say it more times than they want to count, <laughs> and I have been quoted by plenty of kids I've worked with over the years for saying, respectable, respectful people should be able to respectably, respectfully disagree. But that's not the world we live in today. There are people who will cancel you, delete you, unfriend you, whatever you want to call it, because you don't agree with them on whatever it is. You have the right to your point of view as long as it agrees with my point of view. And that's that's a little exhausting for me sometimes because it's um, the uh, the people on the left often talk about, hey, we want to have diversity. We want to have people that are different. We want to have people that look different. But you can't be different, different the way you are. Right. But you still have to have the same attitude about everything. Yeah. Well, that's, that's not diversity. No, it's not. Not at all. And so we live in a world today where we are disconnecting. We have the ability with our technology and whatnot to connect more than ever before in history. Mm-hmm. And we are more disconnected, I believe, than ever before, at least yeah. as I can see it in history. For and sure. it's 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 concerning. If I were, by the way, to only be friends with people who I agreed with on everything, mm-hmm. I'd be sitting in a room by myself. <laughs> I have never met a person on this planet who I agree with on everything. Right. You know, whether it be gun values or Jewish values or political values or, you know, whatever subject we talk about, you know, there's a gazillion things that we can have a point of view on. Mm -hmm. There's not one person on this planet that I have yet to meet who I agree with on everything, but that's okay by me. We can still have a dialogue. We can still maybe learn. And and, and, and it's by dialogue that sometimes we realize, hey, you know what? I hadn't thought of it that way. Wouldn't that be nice if we could sit and have dialogues and actually realize that this is something that we can grow with together? Right. Instead of like, uh, you know, like many high schools, they have debate teams and I'm not against forensics. I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a wonderful experience for kids to have. Mm-hmm. Um, but the debate, think about a political debate. We got some of those maybe coming up, right? And <laughs> right. you got a podium here and you got a podium here and he's trying to prove that he's wrong mm-hmm. and he's trying to prove that he's wrong. Imagine if it was a community of inquiry instead sitting around a common table instead of its separate podiums, trying to talk about. Um, you know, the constitution and the, 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 you know, what's in the best interests of the people of this country. And we actually had a dialogue to try and come to truth as opposed to just trying to prove that I'm a better arguer than you. Mm. That would be great. It would be great. It would be. And the more, the more I get into the gun stuff, the more I'm, I'm like, let, let, I, I've gone from, I think, a small C conservative to a small L libertarian. Okay, I can understand that. Where I'm like, you know, I used to be, uh, I'm at the point now where I'm like, dude, if you want to smoke pot, if you want to do drugs, like, it's not my not my issue, not my thing, not my fight. I'm not interested in doing it. I feel the same way about drinking tequila, by the way. Like, it's not for me. <laughs> Had a bad experience. I'm out. I'm out. I don't want to do this. Um, but if you want to, go right ahead. Like, go right ahead. If it makes you happy, rock on, rock on. And and I feel the same way about about firearms. If it makes you happy, if you want to do it, great. If you don't want to do it, great. But don't tell me that I can't do it, right? Um, Because you don't, you don't think it's cool or you don't like it or you don't, you don't think people should be able to do that. That's completely ridiculous. Yeah, I get that. You know, we need to be able to be free to make our choices, of course, you know, sometimes freedoms have to be limited to a degree. There are certain, you know, s- situations where we have to look at the best interests of our society and our country as a whole. I mean, right. government is there to protect us, or supposed to be there supposed to protect to us, okay? Um, but we have to be allowed to make our own choices, be they mistakes or not sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. We do need things like roads and stop lights, so where there's a little bit yes, of organization yeah, there, yeah. right? Yeah. Thank um, you, President Eisenhower. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, this is cool, yeah. man. 
This is cool. Uh, you've done you've done a lot of work in. You said you spent, spent thirty years in Los Angeles, correct? Um, working with the police, uh, and you had some program with uh, to work with kids, right? Well, I, I really hinted yeah, at this. Before. Yeah, kid, kids make a difference is a nonprofit youth foundation. It's all about empowering a more gener- more conscious generation, raising a more conscious generation of kids. The uh, mission statement is uh, helping make a difference in the lives of kids helping kids make a difference in life. And there's free programs for kids on weekends, typically throughout the year, hiking, maintaining trails, visiting mm-hmm. retirement homes, feeding the homeless, helping at animal shelters, uh, you know, cleaning up habitats, uh, you know, wh- whatever projects you can actually get kids involved in to make a difference. Yeah. And that is really my mission in life. It's my personal and my professional mission just to try and see what we can do about raising a more conscious generation. Mm-hmm. And that runs the gamut of a whole wide array of areas. Yeah, for sure. And so that, yes, that is one of the hats that I wear. Very cool. Beyond this hat. <laughs> right. Uh, so Yehuda has a, a camouflage. Okay. Um, camouflage. camouflage. Oh, we have a whole bunch of those. Yeah. 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 That's pretty cool. He's, uh, we really got to connect you with him because he's, he's, uh, he's, he's a lot of fun. He wrote, he wrote a book called Bullet Points. Why? I, yeah. I love the name of that. That yeah. is Perfect. Bullet points. Why can't American- imagine somebody else hadn't used that yet, <laughs> right? Why Americans should embrace gun control is the subtitle, <laughs> and then every page, right? There's one page that says AR-15s, and it's nine pages of nothing, mm-hmm. and then you know, universal background checks and nine pages of nothing. So it's, yeah, it's a good a good book to be able to take your notes in. There's plenty yeah, of room. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, he's he's a lot of fun. All right, what else? What else? Uh, did you did you go through the process to get a, a permit here in New Jersey? Because this is something I'm going through. Yeah, it's a bit of a pain in the ass. Well, New Jersey doesn't make it as easy as some other places. I'm sure in the country we this know of other true. states. Yes, this is true. And I think uh, Governor Murphy came out recently and wanted to to double the fee for a carry permit to go from two hundred dollars for a two year permit to four hundred dollars for a well, two year permit. And the repermitting and the repermitting yeah, is just you know for a lot years, of people it's. It's, it's an obstacle. It, it is. Yeah. It's, a, it's a financial obstacle. Yeah. So I'm, I'm an instructor up in Massachusetts. And, and how, how are things up there as you see it? <sighs> right. We don't want to thumb on Louisa's here. Okay. Um, in, uh, in Massachusetts, you have to take a, a, the, at the minimum, you have to take a four-hour non-life firing course mm-hmm. in order to get your license to carry. Then after that, you uh, so the, the class is, I don't know, 100, 125 bucks. After that, you... Um, I have to get your license, which is a hundred bucks. It's good for six years, thank goodness. That's a little longer. It is. It used to be twenty five dollars and good for four years when I first got my license twenty years ago. Um, but it's a uh, hundred dollars. It's it's for six years, um, and then then you have the added cost of. Uh, having to buy a gun, we there's only a couple places in Massachusetts that are public ranges where you can rent guns. Okay. Or and when when I talk to people, when I talk to my friends around the country that talk about range range fees, I'm like, dude, what's a range fee? And they say it's the vig that you have to pay to um, to pay to use the range. And I'm like, well, you have, you have to be a member where I live. Like you have to join a join a sportsman's club, um, and uh, and that's how they do it there. But all in all, it's it's an easy on the low end. It's an eight hundred to a thousand dollars before you go from I'd like to get a gun license to shooting your gun. You know, taking the class, buying, uh, getting your license, buying a gun, and joining a shooting range. It's an easy eight hundred yeah. to a thousand dollars. Well, and it's just a lot of bureaucracy and paperwork that really, again, when you have to do it again and again, it's it's yeah, it gets it's it gets a deterrent. Costly. I, that, it that's really the word. I think it's a deterrent. Totally. We had a bill up in Massachusetts last year that um, they wanted to have a written exam. They wanted to have live fire. They wanted to have a de-escalation course and they wanted to have active shooter training just to get a license to possess a gun. Wow. And I'm like, dude, this is, this is going to, this is going to make it like thousands of dollars to get a gun license, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. And some people just can't afford that. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, It should not be, uh, not that there shouldn't be a cost to it, but it shouldn't be unaffordable for for the well, average person. Yeah. And it, then it, then you end up splitting apart into the haves and the have-nots. Yeah. You know? that, well, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. It's like financial discrimination in a way. It is. It is. Yeah. It's a little ridiculous. Yeah. I'm So I'm going through the process in New Jersey. I spent $50 on the license for a non-res license. Then I spent... Ninety-eight dollars on electronic fingerprints. Okay, and I, I dead to go. 
Uh, yes. Yeah, they have the monopoly, you know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> They're the only ones that do this. And it was it was like an extra forty of a like I think it was about an extra forty dollars to to send them from Massachusetts to New Jersey. Ah, okay. Yeah. I actually this is kind of interesting. I had someone uh, just this week, I, I had someone email me. They did the Utah class with me, so I, I, I teach the okay. Utah course. Okay, yeah. And I f- physically like fingerprint people. Oh, they, they still in. do. They still do the ink there. Yeah, I still do the with ink. ink, actual ink. Not, you got oh, it. wow. Yeah, I just haven't had that one done in a and long time. Somebody said to me, they're like, "Why don't you do it electronically?" I'm like, "Well, because it's gonna, it's gonna cost more. I'm gonna have to have more stuff. I'm gonna have to have more material. I'm gonna have to like take the show on the road. So I'm gonna have to bring it in more places, and." Um, and you're going to have to pay more if you do the electronic stuff. Wow. Yeah, it's a little ridiculous. It is. All right, listen, we need to wrap things up. Where can uh, where can people find you? And um, In your car right now. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, 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 most of the people I talk to have social media, and they're like, hey, follow me here and like me here and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm not so much into the social media arena, but um, as far as for... You know, synagogue stuff, by the way, we have a, uh, a YouTube page, which I am not active about putting videos up, but there are some videos and things up there. Mm-hmm. And maybe last night's talk, I'll get a copy of them. We'll post it up there as well. That would be cool. Uh, maybe this even. Uh, yeah. I gotta, I'm, I'm no tech expert at all. I'd rather live in a non-technological world. But nonetheless, uh, the YouTube channel is youtube.com slash, the name of the synagogue is B'nai Tov, B-N-A-I. T O V, um, but a Tov, by the way, means children of good, which is a whole story in and of itself. Uh, okay. But it's a beautiful name for a synagogue. Very cool. Um, so, and we have a website, if you can call it that. Um, but it's never been a developed website. It is yeah. the domain that takes you to the Facebook page. So <laughs> that is uh, B'nai Tov, B-N-A-I-T-O-V dot org. Yeah. Um, trying to think of what else. Uh, yeah, not really into the social media world. I haven't quite gotten there yet. <sighs> and trying to avoid it. You, I, you're a better person than me for not. <laughs> I, uh, I like to tell everyone, I'm, you know, trying to get a bunch of selfies last night. I'm like, I'm a little social media whore. But it is uh, part of the gig when you want people to follow you and like you and subscribe to all your stuff. Uh, it's kind of, kind of what you have to do. Well, and you know so. what? I should throw one other little plug in here, if you don't mind. Absolutely. As I'm about to say it. Um, also on YouTube, first of all, you can go straight there through a website, marsgig.us. Yeah. <laughs> okay. My 13-year-old son has become an aspiring guitar player, and we just set him up with a YouTube channel. Marsgig.us takes you to the YouTube.com slash at sign Marsgig, M-A-R-S-G-I-G. That's cool. And yes. you got to hear him a little bit so last night. This, <laughs> this is got to throw him into this. Absolutely. You wouldn't be a good Jewish father if you didn't. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for recognizing that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we had someone last night um, uh, do the Pledge of Allegiance, right? And and then oh, I don't know somehow uh, somehow the Star Spangled Banner came up. Yes, and you're like, oh, my son play, plays guitar. He's got a banjo here. Bring so yes, yeah, so that was led the really Star, cool. Led the national anthem of Star Spangled Banner on banjo, which it sounds so beautiful on banjo. And he's leading that next week at a uh, Tunnel to Towers uh, rally next weekend. Unbelievable! Yeah, that's awesome. This is great, man. That's that's really cool. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Charlie. It's a pleasure, Rabbi. The the, the pleasure was mine. So hang tight. Um, so we are going to put some links below to uh, the rabbi's synagogue. synagogue? Yes. To the That's the right word. Yes. B'nai Tov? Shul. Shul is a more casual name. There we are. Yeah. It's a warmer know, name. Man. It's I like just... the difference between dad and father, like shul and synagogue. Gotcha. Yeah. We got a home and a house. Yes, exactly. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, we're going to put some links below. Um, if you are not a member of the Second Amendment Foundation, you can join at saf.org. There's a link to that below. And if you uh, want to check out more Pro Freedom Podcasts, you need to go to Self Defense Radio Network. That's sdrn.us. You can find all your favorite Pro Freedom Podcasts there. We thank you guys for watching the show. Please share it with your friends because that is how we get the stagecoach across America. And we'll see you guys again. Easy peasy. All right, thanks. <laughs> well, I'll drive you up here. We got to get uh, a no selfie worry. in the car. Okay. Uh, and then I got to change everything out. Yeah, I hope it was good. I don't know where to go, what to say. I don't know. No, that's fine. So okay. this is... Um